Welcome to what is our penultimate session here amongst the Conference of the Trees at the New York Times Climate Hub. Um, I'm very pleased that we're going to have this session. It's called Riding the Curve, How to Harness Exponential Change. And it is exactly what we need, exponential change. Leading the conversation will be Adam Santarano. Santarano. I messed that up. Adam, I apologize. Um, Adam is a fantastic journalist. He's um, been our uh, European technology correspondent now for a couple of years and is doing remarkable work. And he's going to be leading this conversation. But before he does, I would like to just run a very short video from Google. And we're very grateful for Google, Google for um, supporting this session. Thank you. Everybody knows there's emissions happening in the world. But what most people don't realize is we don't really know where they come from. If you rely on self-reporting, there's always missing emissions in the data. We had this crazy idea that you could use satellites and AI to monitor every major source of emissions in the world. We didn't really think that anybody would ever say yes to something so experimental. And Google.org took a leap on us. Climate Trace is a collaborative effort to measure carbon emissions from various sources and then take that data and put it into a format that anyone around the world will be able to access the Climate Trace tool and the data that we feed into it is used every day in our financial and economic models. There are so many people who have devoted their careers and lives to this, and if everybody spends a little bit of time on it, it will get solved. Hello. It's Satariano for the record. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, because you're being too kind to each other. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, for this panel, uh, which, as you see, is riding the curve, how to harness exponential change. Uh, and what uh, we're hoping to do here is to have a solutions-based conversation, to talk about some of the possibilities uh, that can uh, get us in a position of towards net zero. Um, and we have a wonderful group of guests here who can lead the conversation with us. Uh, to my left uh, is Wanjari Mathai, uh, Vice President and Regional Director of the World Resources Institute in Africa. Wanjari uh, used to be the co-chair of WRI's Global Restoration Council and a senior advisor to the Global Restoration Initiative. She's the current chair of the Wanjari Mathai Foundation and the former chair of the Greenbelt Movement in Kenya. Uh, we also have Sir David King uh, as the founder and chair of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge and uh, Climate Crisis Advisory Group. Uh, David was a uh, strategy advisor the President Rwanda and was a permanent special representative for climate change. Uh, was also the government's chief scientific advisor in the UK from 2000 to 2007. Kayla uh, Megan Burns is a climate and social justice activist who's led campaigns that have resulted in the divestment and sustainable reinvestment of millions of pounds and secured uh, significant targets of uh, carbon reduction from universities. Uh, and she is a uh, student here uh, in Glasgow at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, and we also have Leo Johnson. Uh, Leo is a partner um, at the Dis and disruption lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, he also hosts a Radio 4 program called Future Proofing, which explores uh, exponential tech and the effect that it has uh, on business and society. Um, and so to start, uh, David, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. Um, you have the perspective of having worked both in business and on the policy side of things. And I'm curious for you, what does a successful strategy look like? What is, how are we going to know if we're sort of leapfrogging in a way uh, uh, on the exponential change that is needed? That's an enormous question. Let, let me well, first, just the person let me first of all start by saying 
we are way behind time. Right? We are no longer able to say, let's discuss this for another 15 years. If I could just quickly say what the danger is at the moment. The tipping point, the first tipping point in the 15 that the climate science community talk about, the first one has now gone past. And the worry is that there's a domino effect. And that first tipping point is the Arctic Circle. During the three months of the polar summer, the North Pole is now one of the warmest regions in the Northern Hemisphere. And the net result of that has been the extreme weather events we've experienced all the way around the Northern Hemisphere during those three polar months. No coincidence there. The wind, the cold wind that keeps the Arctic cold and the equatorial regions warm has now become massively distorted. And this distortion is driven by warm air over the Arctic Sea. What sort of temperatures am I talking about? 30 degrees centigrade. And around the land masses there is all of the permafrost. And as the permafrost heats up, methane is released. Temperatures could rise by 20 degrees centigrade, average. And as the Greenland ice melts, which it's already started doing, sitting next to that blue warm sea in the polar summer, we're going to see sea level rises globally of 7.5 meters. So when we talk about managing the future, yes, deep and rapid emissions reduction is essential, but equally essential, we've already put too much in the way of greenhouse gases up there, we have to remove them at scale, and then we have to buy time by refreezing the Arctic. That's why I say you've asked me a very big question. How do we manage those challenges? Here at the COP, the official process, which is very different from this, is to follow up from the, the achievement in Paris. I was the climate envoy for Britain leading up to that. I can hold my hand up and say, that was a wonderful achievement. But we are now putting the dots and commas to the agreement reached in Paris. That means the total focus here is just on that first thing, deep and rapid emissions reduction. If I can very quickly say, my colleagues will really develop the themes. We have never developed a carbon price in much more than the European Union, and I would have to say, and Britain now. Uh, so what, what we need to do is extend that. I worked very hard with the Chinese government on the cap and trade process that they have now introduced. And so China, this year, has gone right across the country with its cap and trade. These two systems are designed so that they can be matched together. We need a much greater extension of geographies putting a price on carbon. The European Union price, finally, is reaching a reasonable level. 60 euros a ton is not bad. It's a very good place to, to spring off into the next five years. So I think that's a big driver, but never relax behind a single solution. We definitely need government regulations and government obligations that set the tone for the private sector to work on. Without the government regulations and obligations, frankly, we stagger on. So we do, do need governments to focus on the importance of regulation to drive us into this low carbon world. And then, may I say as a scientist, finally, we need much more science and technology driven through. And so we now have mission innovation. I'm proud to say I was the founder of the whole idea of mission innovation, spending $30 billion a year on public money, research and development to develop all the post-fossil fuel technologies. We haven't yet focused on all the processes required to remove excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere or on how we keep the Arctic Circle region covered with ice through the polar summer. So I think we've, we've got a bit long way to go, but we can't hesitate. By the way, 197 nations reaching an agreement. This is a glacial process. Uh, we, we are not catching up with where we stand today with the risks of climate change. And I'm looking forward to seeing willing nations stepping up and doing much more. Delighted to hear <coughs> the news today that uh, China and the United States are working together. This is a major step forward. I was pushing for an agreement including the European Union, 
and the UK since we're in the presidency. With that group, we can really get on and do it. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people see this as a, as a big business opportunity. Bill Gates has talked about how the next trillion dollar companies, the next Googles and the like are going to be uh, uh, coming from in the energy sector towards net zero. Um, well, Jerry, I'm curious how, what you think can be done to ensure that that's a just transition, to ensure that those that are benefiting, that the entrepreneurs and businesses uh, are not just coming from the United States or Europe, but also we could see uh, entrepreneurs and others in, in Africa, or Latin America, or elsewhere benefiting as well. No, great question. And, you know, it's important to start by understanding what trans the just transition really means. And, and I think implicit in the word transition is that there's somewhat of a, an, an, an advancing from a state, one state to the next. For Africa and most of the vulnerable, climate vulnerable countries, this transition takes a completely different form. We're not major emitters. We do not have Africa is responsible for 9% of global emissions. So there's no real transition in the sense of some of the, the big emitters that really have to turn on, um, the pressure's really on them to decarbonize and decarbonize fast. The transitions on the African continent have to be seen from at least two or three different uh, perspectives. One is the fact that I come from Kenya. And in Kenya, believe it or not, 90% of our energy is green. It comes from hydro or geo. What we really have to look at is the accessibility of that energy, the cost of that energy, and of course, the, how modern that energy is. Those are the real transitions that we are talking about, and those require significant levels of finance. And the, the, the big discussion around finance is crucial because of the injustice implied in not having that, that finance. And this is what I mean. If you consider the fact that Africa, for example, is such an important part of the global supply chain, the, and, and Latin America, because you included Latin America in that, the beef industry in the North is largely dependent on deforestation of the Amazon the uh, tech industry in Europe, largely dependent on mining in the Congo. And then, of course, the cosmetic industry on palm. And you can go on and on, the cocoa industry. So this, when you hear vulnerable countries talking about solidarity, it's because we are really in this together, that it is not a, an us versus them, that if we do not see to it that the transitions, especially that transform the lives and eliminate poverty on the African continent, which, by the way, is the priority of the just transition, we will not see, um, we will not sustain any transition anywhere. So the justice there for us is around access to energy, as I've explained, finance that ensures that that transition actually happens. And then a really important final thought is that there's been a lot said about how Africa powers itself. And let, let's make no mistake about it. This is not about powering uh, one lantern or a few bulbs. This is about powering Africa's industry, powering Africa's transformation and eliminating poverty. It takes significant amount of energy. And that, therefore, requires a very objective analysis of what opportunities different countries have. So there's been a lot of talk about gas and about whether Africa would consider uh, what options Africa considers. I urge you to suspend any judgment or any um, uh, prescription. What we really need is an objective analysis of what demand is required to power Africa and what options are available, and then, of course, what finance is available. When those options are on the table, we can make a decision whether gas will be part of it with very clear endpoints, very clear, clear exit strategies. But to prescribe at the moment when those um, models are not there would be, uh, would be unfair. Mm. So I think that that's where the justice comes in. That's a good point. 
Uh, uh, Kayla, I, I want to hear from you to, to give a perspective as a successful climate activist. Can, can you tell us a bit about the work that you've been doing and, and what you think uh, the role of an activist can be, and not just the, the divestment, which has been uh, a, a big focus, but also in steering uh, the direction of new technologies or new uh, solutions? Yeah, so I think that's actually a really interesting question, simply because the, it's so often looked to activists um, for, for solutions, but I'm not actually convinced that that is the role of the activist at all. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure you have seen it as well, um, climate activists are becoming younger and younger and younger, and it is so amazing to have such fantastic passions, such fantastic awareness and such amazing energy going into the movement and to care so deeply about this because that's not going to last, like, that's not just having an impact on their lives, they're gonna carry it throughout their lives into the lives of their families and into the lives of their communities. But I think what is really difficult about that actually is the fact that these, these kids, these children, these really young people who are so passionate, they are simultaneously having their childhoods and their futures totally and utterly dismantled by climate change, um, both because of the actual destruction, which we're on the path for, but also because of the pressures which are being put on them to find these types of solutions and to be the answer for those types of solutions. But I actually think that the role of the activist in climate change is much more straightforward than that. I think really the role of the activist is to try and get the proper attention for climate change. It's to try and make sure that there's the right space there for those discussions. It's to try and make sure that there's the political will, the understanding, the backing, and of course making, making space for the actual experts, like people like yourself, Sir David, just to actually employ those kind of solutions that are already there, that already exist from those experts. And I really do strongly believe that that's the role of the activist. We're not here to give the answers, but we're here to try and demand the attention and demand the space which such an immense topic deserves. And I think ideally, in a perfect world, activists wouldn't exist, and they shouldn't exist. And that is simply because on such a mammoth issue, people would actually just take the responsibilities that they need to take. They would you know, avoid the exploitation of people and planet, and the proper care and action would be in place rapidly, and the backing would already be behind it, but unfortunately, that's not really the world that we're living in. Activists have a great role in you know, encouraging innovation because of the pressures which we, which we do put on organizations, governments, individuals, people, basically th the world as it is. But I think so much of what we actually do is just down to that space, down to that kind of, you know, bringing attention and getting really what we need from that. And in the ideal world, it, they really wouldn't exist. But unfortunately, that's not the world that we're living in. So really, right now, the role of the activist is to fill that gap and to make sure that we're getting the right action as quickly as we need it to, and the right, and the right types of action, and just as you mentioned as well, the just types of action as well, and to make sure that everyone's voices are heard in those conversations. So I think that's, that's really how I feel about the activist. That's a good transition to, to Leo, because uh, you at the PwC interact a lot with a lot of corporate uh, entities, and, and so I'm wondering, uh, as they're getting more and more pressure, businesses are uh, to take action. Um, what are the conversations like that you're having with executives and, or in boardrooms um, to, to make the changes that are somewhat being demanded by them from the public and to make changes that are not just PR changes in which uh, it, it, it provides a, a marketing bump, but in terms of the actual effect is very limited? I think there's a real risk that business answers the wrong question, which is how do we manage the PR? How do we like, put a lid on the activists? How do we sign up to a net zero agreement that shunts it through space and time 50 years ago into, into the next managers who have to deal with it 50 years down the road? Um, I think the real conversation with the, with the C-suite is how do you answer the questions that you have posed, that you have posed, that you have posed? How do you make the transition just? How do you make it not just about net zero, but about megawatts, about sucking out the carbon that we need to suck out? 
about delivering on a capitalism that is for the many, not for the few. Um, you know, I, I think 30 years ago, I want you to pick up on your point, we had, you know, we had a Berlin Wall that fell, and that was heralded as the victory of capitalism. That was no victory. That was table stakes. That was a chance for capitalism to get in and show that it could actually deliver. And I think we are now at this moment where there is a huge threat. There is the instability of inequality that will take that system down. There is also, of course, a whole load of other threats, climate change right among them, that will amplify those inequalities and those threats. But suddenly, with, with exponential technology, if we do it right, and there's this great quote from Kentaro Toyama that technology is not the answer, it's the amplifier of intent. If we take the arsenal of tech that we've got and try to turn it, armed with that intent, into the big problems that are out there, around food, around sanitation, around water, around housing, around forests, around sucking out the, the gigatons of carbon that we need to do by doing things like stabilizing the permafrost that's melting in Lake Baikal with gigatons that would dwarf the commitments that have been made this over the last two weeks. If we deploy tech to solve those problems, then I think we got a chance for delivering on some of these asks. Uh, I, I wanna, in the context of this idea of exponential change, which, which I think is this uh, thing of something that can uh, put us on a, speed up the curve and speed up the trajectory in which we're on. I, I'm wondering if each of you can sort of give us a, a, a flicker of hope. Is there, is there one project or one thing that you see where you look at and where you say, if we were doing more of this, if this could be um, put out more broadly or done at a bigger scale, that it would make a real difference. So I'm wondering if any, uh, each of you can, and can hit on that. Yeah, I could start. You know, I love this studio because it's uh, <laughs> surrounding us are these beautiful trees. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that nature took such a front seat at this, at this COP and the fact that there's a, a clear acknowledgement that the role of nature in addressing climate is so central. It's really important, the tropical part of this world, there are three major forests that are crucial for our survival. One is are the Southeast Asian forests, and, and we know today that the Southeast Asian forests are net emitters of carbon. They are not sinks, they're not taking carbon out at all. Then we have the mighty Amazon that is teetering on the edge of becoming an emitter of carbon. We are about to lose the Amazon to, um, to becoming an emitter. And then we have the Congo forest that remains the only net carbon sink in the tropical world. And this is crucial. And so to see the protection of these forests, the restoration and halting the deforestation is really, really important. So that to me is gonna be important. But what needs to happen? Article six right here as the negotiators are doing their thing. We have got to get a price on carbon. If we don't get a price on carbon, there is no incentive to protect these wonderful carbon sinks. At the moment, the wonderful fresh air of the Congo forest is $6 a ton. The toxic carbon, $60 a ton. Where is the incentive? We've got to get that right. Kayla, do you have an, an example that comes to mind? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a massive question. So in return, I feel like I'm gonna give you a massive answer. Um, <laughs> And honestly, I think that the biggest thing, like the, the most the single, the utmost biggest problem for me is realistically the whole system that we're in, the current entire system that we live in um, is so unsustainable. It, like one of my big things that I love talking about is like how, how I suppose climate action is ableist. Because quite frankly, um, to, like I have different medical conditions, I need different treatments. And it is literally impossible to, for me to live in a zero waste in, to limit my emissions in any kind of way that I would like to. So I think really what we need is that whole systems change. And I found it quite funny that you mentioned capitalism because I do think that capitalism as it is right now is a massive, massive problem. Um, because alone it is built on the concept of like unlimited growth, it's built on exponential growth. And exponential growth looking at the situation that we're in right now, doesn't exactly match with the limited resources we have on the planet. 
Um, so I really think that we need to stop chasing that dragon of exponential growth and really start focusing on people, on planet, on how we live our lives and how we can live them together. Because inexplicably, as, as you mentioned as well, capitalism and climate change are so inherently linked to other really damaging things that we're seeing in our society. So everything from sexism, ableism, racism, you name it, any form of discrimination, they are inherently linked together. So I think we need this whole systems change in order to have any hope of tackling it. And that is massive, and that is so scary for so many reasons. Because I think it's scary for the youth, um, speaking as one of the youth, mm -hmm. because realistically, we aren't seeing that systems change right now. And I, I think that petrifies so many of us, because we know that it's there, we, we know that it has to happen, and yet we aren't seeing the change that we need to see. And then from the exact opposite side, it's petrifying because you're looking at, right, so you mean right now, I need to dismantle the entire systems that I'm familiar with living in, that I've spent my whole life living in, and live in an entirely different kind of way. And I think that that is also really petrifying and really, really challenging. But I think it's something that we desperately need to, need to tackle. And realistically, it's, it's how we need to shift entirely away from that focus of exploiting people and planet. And I think the prime example of that, and how it impacts climate, is through women and girls. So, it is estimated that educating women and girls actually would save, I think it's about 85 gigatons of carbon from being emitted um, by 2050, just by educating women and girls. Now, funny enough, that is a mammoth number. And again, I love that you mentioned Africa's emissions are 9%, um, because 85 gigatons of carbon is actually 9% of, of the carbon that's currently in our atmosphere. So again, that's another very funny matchup. But I think that example alone really illustrates we have the tools there. We know the actions that need to be taken. The best actions that we can take to fight climate change, to tackle a climate crisis, are the ones that already exist. We just need to back them. We need to, we need to get them in there. We need to employ them rapidly. And we need to see the actual change and the effect. And we need it happening now. So, I think a systems change on a whole. I'm sorry, that's such a massive answer, but yeah. I feel like it's it's really what we need. <laughs> it's a point. <poor, laughs> <laughs> I mean, it reminds me there, there is the pots of money out there to be spent. Uh, the, the UN uh, has, but there's a story today in Reuters that I was reading about uh, just the length of time that it takes for a country like the Philippines um, to get access to these funds for the kind of uh, projects that they want uh, to, 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 to make the changes. Leo, I'm curious from your perspective, there must be a project or an initiative that you've yeah. seen uh, that you okay. that you think is sort of fits under this rubric of exponential change. Okay, so I'm going to sound like I'm trying to defend capitalism, which is really not a good place to be in. <laughs> but, but I'm thinking like if we take a look at the problems, if we take like there's 1.2 billion people without access to power, powerless because they got no power. Then the question is, which we know, then they're spending 50 to 70 percent of their incomes on kerosene, firewood, a million deaths a year from air quality. So the question is, how do you deliver a solution into that? And you know, then I'm thinking, okay, there's stuff like this Oxford startup, M Copper, which takes the D-Lite, which is way too expensive, no one can afford it, but then it puts a SIM card in it, which means they can lease it for 40, 50 cents a day. Then suddenly they got access to microinsurance, to the ability to buy the Kickstart hand pump for about 36 bucks, which triples the amount of crops they can grow because it gets them access to the underground water table that's there for 98% of unirrigated sub-Saharan African land. In one study, incomes went up from 180 to 1,800 dollars a head, exam pass rates up from 58 to 83%. You know, it's just got this web of benefits. And by the way, it's also like massively increasing their chance to become viable small-scale farmers, getting access to refrigeration, agricultural equipment as well. Plus then you can do stuff like Trotro Tractor with just Uber for tractors, where suddenly instead of having to buy a tractor for 32,000 bucks, they can share it. You know, yes, it's capitalism, okay? Yes, it is. but. <laughs> It's capitalism with a different intent, which is not just making money for the sake of money, whatever the environmental and social consequences. It's trying to look at, here is the problems, and then can we use the market to deliver into them? And my hunch is we're at this pivotal moment where the system hasn't had that as its goal. We completely need that system change. And it's not around profit for the sake of profit, whatever, and that has to be 
just dismantled as the, ide as, as, the ide as the ideology. But if it's about solving these problems, and as a result of that, you create market, and you create some growth, then I'm totally on, on board with that and trying to accelerate whatever those solutions are. And I know no one is going to clap this response because it sounds like it's pro-capitalism. <laughs> you were right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, David. But is that, is that wrong? Actually, can you tell me, do you disagree with that? Is no. that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what else do we do? What else do we do? David, he's asking you. Uh, you said the next five years are going to determine the next millennia. Um, at the onset, your, 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 your sort of overall assessment was bleak, and I think there can be good reason for that. But what makes you optimistic? Can I come to that? I want to first of all get into this discussion about capitalism. I'm just along for the ride. We yep. have a capitalist system in which you can have a tax haven, an offshore tax haven. All of these big companies and these extraordinarily wealthy individuals, what is the point of having more than five million pounds, let alone five billion, let alone, you know, what is the point? And it only seems to be a question of individual power that is involved. And that is what current capitalism is delivering. And I think we would all agree that is not the future. Wow, we really need to rewrite the rule book of how capitalism works. And the next thing I would say, and then I'm going to come to answer your question, the word eco-civilization, does that mean anything to you? Because it should do. It was brought forward by the Chinese in 2012, rewritten into the Chinese Communist Party uh, constitution. And the previous big rewrite was when they introduced market principles and their economy took off and their well-being took off. But now they've introduced eco-civilization and I think we could all follow suit. What it means, and they say this very explicitly, is manage human well-being alongside managing ecosystem well-being. Now, who would disagree with that? Do you want to disagree with that? <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, that's not the system that is delivering now. We put no value on the ecosystems, which is why it has been so difficult to get a reasonable price on carbon. Let me come to my favorite project of the moment, and that is, the title is Marine Biomass Regeneration. Now, what am I talking about here? The analyses of the level of fish stock and mammals in the ocean three or 400 years ago are that we're down to less than 1% today. Now, what, what was the big driver of that? This has only emerged in recent scientific studies. And that is, we went after the whales. That was our first effort to get oil. We were after their blubber. And we hadn't yet discovered oil under the ground. And we killed the vast majority of whales and took their blubber. And that continued into the 20th century until we got down to 0.3% of the original number of whales. That's the best estimate we have. What we didn't know was the key function these whales played in the biological system of the oceans. So let me just very quickly tell you what we've learned. And it's quite a lovely story. The big whales, the blue whale, the right whale, they feed at the bottom of the ocean. And they, they typically might be feeding a mile down, two miles down in the very deep ocean. And I have to say this, under these high pressures, their orifices close. So what do they come up to the surface for? It's not just oxygen, it's to relieve themselves in the surface. And I'm going to tell you the secret to everything is whale poo, right? Because whale poo not only brings fertile material up from the bottom of the ocean, it also brings iron. And iron is not stable in the ocean, and it's the missing element in the photon zone, in the zone that's open to the sunlight, that top layer of, ice, of water. When a pod of whales, they tend to move together, comes up to the surface, typically, very quickly, a layer of whale poo gets across the ocean, perhaps 1,000 square kilometers, but more typically 10,000. 
Within a month, that area is green with phytoplankton. Within three months, sorry, within a week it's green with phytoplankton, three weeks, you've got a billion fish. Why is this? Because there are still hundreds of thousands of fish eggs in the ocean. The average female fish lays 100,000 eggs a year. But most of them, when they produce larvae, the larvae die. If there's a phytoplankton there, that's the feedstuff for baby uh, fish. They eat it, they survive. And so you have a billion fish in this area after three weeks. Now, of course, up come the whales. This is their circular economy. Up come the whales and have a feast on the fish. Uh, a blue whale, one mouthful, about a million fish. They have enormous size. They've got a lot of blubber on board to keep themselves warm and safe. And what I want to say is this. If we can artificially create whale poo, which is what we're working on, and then spread over a section of the deep ocean, we want to see if we can recreate fish, provide more food for the baby whales. They tend to eat up closer to the surface and bring up the whale population. When we removed the whales, the initial thought was the fish stock of the world will increase because the whales are consuming the fish. It's just the reverse. Mm -hmm. The fish have been overfished in the world, but the bigger problem is the loss of the function of the whales. And that's what we're now trying to work on. Our oceans are essentially deserts today, the big, deep oceans. We want to try and restore them. And we all remember those paintings of the ancient ships going out and the whales everywhere. We want to restore that. Thank you. Um, I want to... Can I just quickly add, uh, we will take up tens of billions of carbon in that process, recreating the forests of the ocean. That's a, that's a great example. Thank you. Uh, I want to give the audience an opportunity to, to ask a question or defend or uh, criticize capitalism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name is Johanna Suleta, and I'm a cross-pollinator. So the question comes from there. You all, uh, well, the title is how to exponentialize change. And you all have such a power, individual, I mean, within the work and platforms that you're each doing. So I was wondering, are you collaborating? Do you plan to collaborate uh, after this panel? How would you exponentialize that with what has come together ah, right now? Thank you. Competition against collaboration. <laughs> You want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I could, I, I love that uh, whale story. And the World Resources Institute, as some of you may know, is, um, is involved in, in oceans work and, and oceans uh, restoration. And I, I think I'm going to go back and find out how are we not involved in, in restoring the forests of the ocean? That was really beautiful. But I think that there's a lot of collaboration. In fact, we cannot achieve exponential change without collaboration. So yes, yes, and yes. Can I throw up maybe a collaboration with you, yes. which is you've talked about the forests. Um, and I'd love to see if like this, it's a bit on the edge, this one, um, <laughs> which, is, which is, so the Cayapo indigenous community in Brazil manage a land space of Amazon forest, which is like twice the size of Britain. And the carbon contained within that forest is estimated to be about 2.5 billion tons. And you know, as, as you mentioned, in the Amazon, actually, it's going down. The log is coming in, net emitter of, of carbon. But the Kayapo control the checkpoints that the loggers come in and out of. So the question is, can you get them enough resources to get them to act as forest stewards to protect the forest? And there's a startup, and it's an exponential tech startup. So yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's the market. Um, but, it's, but it's using satellites. Um, high quality imagery to monitor deforestation and verify that the forests are standing. And then it's actually using a token payment, it's a startup called Gain Forest, a token payment 
which investors can actually pile money into as well to increase the amount that they pay off. They'll get to increase their resources effectively for the payment for ecosystem services to keep that carbon in there. So that would be something I think, yeah. if yeah. that could be scaled up and really made to work properly, would that work for you? I'm, I'm going to be honest, like straight <laughs> up here, I'm still a student that eats beans, so any of you that will take me, I would love to collaborate. <laughs> 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 Uh, Kay Kay Kayla has exams. You said Monday and Wednesday? Monday and Friday. Um. <laughs> Can I just uh, quickly okay. say, the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge University is unlike most centers. We're not competitive. We're a hub. And we're working around the world on these projects. Yes, we want to collaborate. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, <clears throat> my name's Enlai. Uh, I'm representing Architects Declare, and I'm also the head of uh, sustainability and innovation at Smith Hamalas and Architects. And I want to address Mr. Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, I believe that uh, maybe you should know better uh, than to conflate capital and the movement of capital with capitalism. To pr to imagine that innovation can't exist without capitalism is a bit of a, I think, a, a slide. And I think if you can look to the idea of uh, redistribution of capital, not in a mercurial sense, but in a, in a way in which uh, has a balance or another set of uh, criteria to which this capital moves, then I think we would be a little bit better off than the way you suggest these small Startups are being funded. Thank you. If I've, un if I've understood you right, what you're really getting at is what, what capitalism values. Um, and I think I maybe kind of completely agree with you that if the only thing that it values is pure financial outcomes, that's what takes us over the cliff. It's like a system with the wrong destination put in the sat nav, we will always go over the cliff. And what interests me about that example of the forests is actually it's finding a way to inject a different value stream into what the system is rewarding. So it's actually working with the environmental and the social and trying to get capital flows to come and go into the good stuff. So it's not like turning off the tap. It's like getting the tap to flow into the good stuff. I mean, that, that seems to be the vision. Does that... Hello, hello. Uh, not really, because um, the, the primary rule, or, or I guess the, the rule of capitalism, as it was said by our young activist, is, is uh, growth and eternal growth. And in order to stimulate that growth, uh, you need a market for that growth. Yeah. And the market for that growth has its limits, and the limits are our planetary boundaries, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody's going to disappear disagree with that. But uh, the, the di difficulty that capitalism has in that case is the underpinning value that uh, capitalism is about uh, concentration or, or trying to gain capital. And the problem is when you gain capital uh, uh, systematically, uh, then the concentration of that capital creates these imbalances that are natively uh, problematic. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, this is a proposition, but I think that is the core mechanism of capitalism. Whereas there are other uh, constructs of politics and finance where that is not the core value. Okay, so I think I totally agree with you, but just like the question I keep coming back to is like, how do you solve these problems at scale with another system? I can see you can redirect capital flows into good stuff, but I can't see anything that's going to deliver on the problems of the many better than trying to do that, than trying to re rework it, trying to rewire the system we've got. I can't see like tearing it all down. If you can construct something else that'll get the problems we solved and the urgency of solving those problems fast, then I, then I get it. But I, I'm not, I don't understand what the alternative is. I would love, I will embrace it if you can can, can I yes. come in? I'm sorry. Um, so actually, I think this is quite funny because, like, hands up, I've just criticized capitalism, yeah. and I, I fully stand by my criticism, but 
at the same time, like, also hands up, I do have my own company. Um, so that, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, but what basically what we do, we are entirely focused on like accessibility and affordability, and also the, the climate footprint that we put on it. We everything we do. If we were to work with a large organization, basically we charge the large organizations a premium, so that they, that then trickles down and basically gets to your average person in a much better way, so that we're able to provide prices. What we do is music and podcast production. Currently, if you want to record music and get it out there, you're talking thousands of pounds. We do it less than a tenth of that, and we do it by, by that trickle down, I think, that you're kind of referring to. So it is like a middle point that we're meeting at, I think. But it is a total system change, because unfortunately, those aren't the values that you typically see um, at all within the capitalist system that we're living in. We aren't focused on making on yeah. making cash. We're focused on making it affordable, getting to people, and really harnessing that pe people energy and making a community rather than making money. And I think that that is like a really key difference in, in the yeah. two situations because in the current capitalist system, it is make money. It is of whatever cost. It doesn't matter whatever impact. It doesn't matter. But the system that I'm currently using is the impact isn't measured in finance, the impact is measured in individuals and in communities, in our sustainability impact as well, and how we can make it more affordable and accessible for individuals. And I, I think yep. there's a, yeah. Bring it on. Great. <laughs> that, let's go. Uh, Sarah, another question. Um, hi, my name is Katrina. I'm a third year student um, visiting from the US and I have been a huge fan of um, one year your work and um, following um, the work of your mother and the Green Belt movement in Africa is so inspiring. Um, and what I've been hearing a lot on this panel is kind of this dichotomy between community-based solutions and technology-based solutions. So my question to you, the panel, is to um, kind of what do you see as the relationship between community and technology-based solutions in the future? Do you think that one should be emphasized more than the other? And how do you kind of see that relationship um, working out in a climate renaissance, if you will? Thank you for that. That's, that's a great question. You know, I think that, that the, the previous exchange was crucial because it's responding to the question for who for whom is it of benefit? And that, that is, that's central, because even with technology, we have, for example, the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector in Africa is responsible for 60% of the employment. To be able to ensure that that sector continues to grow, to grow sustainably, we have to look at who benefits and how those benefits are spread across the value chain. And also how we increase productivity sustainably engaging technology, but who benefits from that technology? So I think that's where the shift really is. It's in the ownership, it's in, for example, look at women farmers. Women who are responsible for the agricultural sector and the productivity of food are the ones who least have access to land, least have access to capital to invest in technology, and on and on and on. You can see where I'm going. Ensuring that equity, is central to that sustainability. And then, so the technology itself is great, but in whose hands? Thank you. I saw another hand. Hello. My name is Frederick. Uh, I come from Belgium. And I have a question. Um, I really, um, I read a lot of your newspaper and many newspaper in different languages. And there is one topic I never read about is the problem of overpopulation. Why is that? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to speak about the overall coverage of the New York Times on that topic, but I think it's an important one. And David, you raised your hand. Do you have uh, a position on, on this one? I think it is an important one. But at the same time, we need to understand population dynamics in the way it's operated in the past. So for example, here in Britain, uh, for hundreds of years, on average, a woman had seven to eight children uh, during her lifetime, of which two survived into maturity. Right? So the, the survival level of small children was never high 
because there was no real understanding of the carrying of disease in water and so on. And in every society in the world, you see the same pattern of behavior. As we shift forward and the survival rate of small children goes up, we discover women have some magic potion. They drop the number of children they have. And we, we can see this, I can reproduce this in all sorts of different societies, whether it's Christian or Muslim or Catholic or whatever, the same rules apply. You find women, for example, in England, how many children do they have on average? Two. What is the number for a sustainable population? 2.1. Uh, so somehow there's something women have that we don't quite understand. But the point I'm making is that as this happens, women become better educated, more empowered, they want to contribute to society more, and the net result is they don't have as many children. But nor do they need to, because as they grow older, they don't need to have children to look after them. Right, so we, we're in a, a mode of development which sustains the population level. Now, I don't mean to say that there's nothing we should do about it. Of course, the availability of contraception is a key to this process. Uh, and of course, female education is a key to this process. We need to really understand what delivers this more quickly. And in those countries that are delivering this more quickly, there is a clear understanding around this. So I, I think I, beware of raising population as the big problem, because it turns out there's a self-regulating process. I, th I think as well around population is like, realistically, if you want to blame population, then what's the solution to that problem? Like, democide, genocide, those, those aren't valid solutions. Like, oh my gosh, pe people's lives have value and that's not something that we can underestimate. That's not something you can just cast a magic wand and be like, problem solved, that's, that's not a solution. Yeah. And as well, I think, going back to the systems change, we need to decouple like pollutions, emissions from population. There's, there's no other option. We have the number of people that we have. We can't just suddenly half the population of the world. We need to be able to serve people on the earth sustainably. We all have to live. We all have a right to life. And that, that can't just be taken away. We need to find ways to live sustainably. We need to change the system so that, that is possible and achievable. That's absolutely right. And, and that, that which, the point you make about population is so important. So often, population is somehow coupled with we have to somehow control women to manage this population discussion. It's about a quality of life. It's about ensuring that girls get education, women get access to prosperity for their families and the quality of life goes up. It is not about population and somehow we censor certain communities from prosperity and address the population issue as a problem. That's not the issue. The issue is quality of life. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great uh, point to leave on. It sort of captures the, the, the challenge ahead, and, and you all did a wonderful job of, of explaining some of the, the possibilities. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This has been a real pleasure. Please stick around for the other panels coming up. <laughs>